and we've been talking a lot about bark, and we kind of coined this phrase "barkophile" because we just we love bark. And like Tom said, I mean, there is a lot of value to that for an ornamental feature. So, what's so great about bark? We have just that it's an ornamental feature. Not only just the fact that you know leaves are not on a lot of these trees for a good part of the season, but they do enhance the quality of the actual ornamental plant as well. Um, I don't do handouts, so I do apologize. So, and we're going to go through quite a few trees. Um, but with bark in itself, it is very diverse. We have different colors. We have different textures. Uh, we have exfoliation bark, and that's what gets really fun. We have early exfoliation when they're young, and then that we may lose that. We have some species that don't have exfoliation when they're young, and they get it later in their life. So there's a lot of variability, a lot of exciting but ultimately adds multi-seasonal interest because this is what we're used to, uh, unfortunately. And this is a pretty typical Fargo landscape, which is absolutely horrible. Uh, so we, we want to get beyond our despair. And so why do we want multi-seasonal interest? Because we want to have happy trees. So just like Bob Ross, we're going to have happy trees. I wanted to start with one that will never, ever grow. Uh, but this is a zone 10 to 11. I apologize, at least for those of you in, in this room in Colorado, mm -hmm. this projector is absolutely horrible. Well, well, this not, 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 not here, at all. Right but this is rainbow eucalyptus. Right if you ever get a chance to go right here. Here. to Florida, right. you're in Hawaii, right. uh, you have an opportunity to see this type of bark. And again, this projector is horrible. Uh, this should have some nice reds, orange, greens, yellows all in it. So I'm going to apologize, at least for here in Fargo, this presentation is going to be absolutely horrible. Um, Manchurian striped maple. So we're going to start with uh, some maples. And I just want to talk in general about them, and then we're going to look at the bark. So this is a smaller tree. The, it has a really nice form. The fall color is yellow, so nothing too exciting there. Uh, but what's neat about it is the bark itself. It has this green-white vertical striping. And it maintains that for a good long time. Here you can see the fall color in contrast with that kind of green and yellow, or green and white striping. And so it's a really, really striking plant um, in, you know, in the landscape. Uh, Acer triflorum, uh, this is one that is reliable for a good fall color, but it is uh, propagated by seed. And so it's variable with the color that you're going to get. You can get some yellows, orange, or reds. NDSU has selected one that's red. Uh, so you get a really nice fall color. Uh, good high quality foliage in the summer too. It's a trifoliate maple, so it has three leaflets, not a single leaf. Uh, a smaller tree, 25 by 20, and what's great about it, it has this a vertical fissuring peeling bark. And it is quite attractive, and it's actually seen very early on uh, in its growth. So it's a very attractive tree very early on. Here you can see the three leaflets, and it actually uh, you know, gets a really nice kind of pumpkin, at least this selection is orange aglow, and this has been selected more for that orange-red color. Uh, here's just another couple shots of what you can see, and, and unfortunately with a lot of these trees, people don't properly limb them up, uh, so you can actually see the bark. Uh, and here is a good example where it has been properly pruned to enhance the bark feature. What's nice about the triflorum is that we don't really see the damage with sun scald in the winter because of this type of bark. Uh, this is a new one for the NDSU release. It's a Costata birch. It's a dwarf Korean birch. This one I'm really excited about because uh, we have river birch, which we're going to mention uh, here in just a moment. Uh, but there is one that's similar to this. It's a dwarf, uh, but it's not reliably hardy for us in our region. And this one is extremely reliable. Uh, it's also a dwarf. We uh, got a picture of a full-size Costado when we were in uh, the Morton Arboretum down in Chicago. And as you can see, it will be about 25, 30 foot tall. Ours is only about 8 foot tall. And the name is cinnamon curls because the inside of the bark is actually cinnamon. On the outside, it's more of a, a creamy white. Uh, but a really beautiful natural form. And, and again, this projector is just absolutely horrific. Uh, but the background of the snow on this plant, and when you see it, is just absolutely gorgeous. Great profile, outstanding color. You know, this is one that would make a great accent plant into any entryway, whether it's a residential or a commercial type setting. Which goes into then river birch. River birch for us, 
Uh, most of the cultivars are not extremely hardy for us. We hit about that zone four. Once we get into zone three, we see a lot of tip dieback. Even in the zone four, we can see some tip dieback. Also with uh, river birch, we see a lot of problems with chlorosis, just what was mentioned earlier with the soil. Um, so we can have some of those issues. So we've got to be mindful of our soil type. But uh, with river birch in general, though, we have that really nice, creamy, peeling bark. And this is more of a later. Uh, it doesn't start to peel until it starts aging a little bit. What's nice about uh, river birch compared to all the other birch is that it is uh, completely resistant to bronze birch borer, which is the number one problem that we have with birches and ultimately with decline of them. And this doesn't have that. Uh, we do have a release out of NDSU that is resistant also or tolerant to uh, pH, high pH. So we don't have the chlorophyll issue with Northern Tribute. And that's going to be on the market here in a few years. So don't get too excited about running to the nurseries and trying to find this or asking for it. It, it will come eventually. But no winter kill, no chlorosis, and then the outstanding, just beautiful peeling bark. And you know, all these trees, just they, they scream, you know, just touch me, feel me, hug me. You know, that's why we have these barcophiles. You, you got to get intimate with your, with your trees. Heritage River Birch is really common, but this is one that you'll find in the nursery. And I don't really recommend it because they, they do get some winter kill, especially if you're into a true zone three uh, somewhere in the state. So you do have to be careful with this one. Uh, paper birch is one that does very well for us, but again, it is re uh, susceptible to bronze birch borer. Uh, so you never want to allow your birches to be stressed. Uh, but we get that nice peely bark. Again, uh, it's being washed out for us here. but. You know, really beautiful, beautiful bark uh, in the winter time, even during the summer, because it's just, you know, a nice vivid white, really stands out as the landscape. But we want to make sure these birches stay moist, cool uh, with our soil, and that helps with the bronze birch borer component. If they get stressed, then you can have serious issues. Prairie Dream Paper Birch is the one I recommend, not just only because it came out of NDSU, but it is bronze birch borer resistant. Uh, also, within the drought we had with 2012, all of the birches out at our research farm were in pretty poor condition. A handful of them were doing well. That dwarf Korean birch I mentioned, as well as Prairie Dream. And this is readily available in the trade. Uh, you can find it in many nurseries uh, locally. But it just really performs well, and it's the brightest white bark out of all of the cultivars of paper birch. Uh, so quite striking, you know, even with the yellow fall color, you know, we need to have diversity, but it's nice sometimes even to have the yellow, but that yellow and white is, is quite, quite striking to have that bark color. I'm a big fan of hornbeam, uh, so carpinus. The older branches develop a fluted muscle-like appearance. So just like what you see, you know, with your arms and your legs, with, you know, with, with our muscles, that's the type of wood that this develops. So it's kind of creepy at first, but it kind of, you, know, you get used to it, but it's very unique. But it is a smaller tree, 25 foot. Uh, one of the big problems with it is, too, also has variable fall color. So I know we're talking bark, but it's also nice to have these other ornamental features. Uh, but it's pretty much was uh, propagated by seed as well. So you just didn't know what you were going to quite get. Uh, it's tolerance of periodic flooding, which is nice. So if you are in an area where you do receive flooding, it's a good one for that. It's, it's, that's its entire uh, environment that it really enjoys. But what's great, and part of what this talk is hopefully going to come across, is not only uh, is bark exciting, but it's just another feature to focus on and, and a different way to look at these trees. But also, here we have one that's pest free. Uh, and we have the big problem that we're facing now, emerald ash borer. You know, not a matter of if, but when it's going to hit North Dakota. We have Asian longhorn beetle coming as well. Uh, and so there, we need to get diversity. It's no longer, you know, we just can't do autumn blaze maple. What a stupid idea that was. Uh, and so we need to get variety. We need to have diversity. And so here, this is what this is all about, is talking about diversity and ornamental features. Um, so here's kind of that fluted uh, look to it. Traditionally, the fall color, again, is more of a yellow. Uh, out of uh, Johnson's Nursery in southeast Wisconsin at Menominee Falls, they released a what's called fire spire. And it's a very tight upright of a hornbeam with really nice fall colors, reliably red fall color. Uh, and it's, it's a quite striking plant. It's one I'm, I'm definitely recommending. I'm a big fan of hackberry, too. You know, hackberry is, is just a beautiful tree. 
used a lot on, on boulevards because it can withstand just about any condition, it compacted soil, poor, poor pH, whatever. Extremely urban tolerant, great tree. Uh, you know, again, we're looking more at a yellow fall color, um, but with the corky bark extensions on them. You know, I, I kind of enjoy that. Some people don't really like it, but I find it, you know, to be intriguing. It's, it's again, it's a little bit of variety than just a standard smooth bark. Uh, Katsura tree. This is a tree I really love. It doesn't maybe have necessarily the best bark, but it has a little bit of a feature to it. But it's the overall package that I really love about this tree. And not too many people are familiar with Katsura tree. But it has a uh, kind of more of a shaggy bark where it attaches in the middle and it will split on either end at the top and the bottom. And I'll show you a picture of that here in just a moment. But here's the form. It's 40 by 25, so it's still a bigger tree now. Uh, but it has a, you know, a little tighter kind of uh, width to it. Again, it has variable fall color, but that's actually one of the better features. But the, the leaves really, and again, you know, we're talking bark, but now we're going to get to talk about leaves. The leaves are kind of cool because when they first come out, they have a citrus uh, fragrance to them. Now, it's not going to knock you over, but, it, but you do get a, you know, feel of that. If you have a bench underneath there, you can really enjoy that. Uh, and then um, when you end up, when they senesce in the fall, they actually smell like vanilla and cinnamon. And it's, this is quite striking. You can smell this 50 feet away. And, and I really enjoy it. Um, but here's the bark where it, it gets this kind of peely bark when it's younger. Uh, when it gets older, it kind of makes this little zigzag pattern. So, you know, it is, you know, not the most exciting bark, but it's the whole package, I think, that I really like about it. And again, this is, uh, this projector is unbelievable. Because um, this is not neon leaves. So, but it is a mix of these uh, apricot, kind of red, apricot, orange, yellow. It does this real mix of a fall color. It's not just one solid color, which I find quite attractive. Um, and, and again, so you can, they can be kind of variable, but, you know, this should be, this is a really nice apricot kind of color, but it's not really coming across. But whenever I, whenever I go into like an arboretum in the fall and there's a catsura tree, I mean, you can just smell it, like I said, from 50 feet away and you're, you're looking for it. Where is the catsura? Because it's quite, quite fragrant. Uh, Kentucky coffee tree, uh, again, this is one that is awesome for the urban environment. Uh, it, it does have that interesting bark pattern. Again, these are not ones that are, you know, jumping out saying, wow, amazing bark, but it is cool bark in general, but it's the whole package. Uh, again, very large tree, 70 by 40, maybe a little bit smaller, again, depending on where it's located, but it's an urban tolerant tree, coming up on a lot of the uh, boulevard lists throughout the state. Uh, no serious pests or disease issues, at least at this point, you know, so again, it's about diversity. But the bark itself, it's a very Stiff bark, you know, when you look at this at first, it's like you, you want to go ahead and start peeling it like you do like a river birch, but you really can't. It, it's a pretty stiff bark, but it has a lot of, a lot of good textural component to it. Uh, American hophorn beam uh, is also another one that is gaining value, uh, and I'm really excited about emerald ash borer. I think nothing better could have happened. Because now we're forced to do diversity. You know, it's great that ash, ash are great trees. Don't get me wrong, but 80% in the town is not a good idea. And so it's great that emerald ash borer is coming across, so we will be forced to diversify, because that is what we need. Uh, we never learned. You know, Dutch elm disease, great. You know, we learned from that, not really. But here, the same thing. We get that vertical fissuring that exfoliates at the end, uh, similar to that young uh, Castura. But then, again, the whole package. We get this hop-like fruit. Uh, again, a, a little bit larger tree, 30 by 20, but no serious pests or disease. You know, so these are the things that we should be looking at. One big liability, though, is not tolerance of salt. So, you know, I do see them on the boulevards, and I don't think that's a really good idea. But the bark itself, you know, has a really neat texture to it. You know, here you can see where it is doing the long fissuring of peeling. Uh, here on the older bark, you get more of a plating type of an effect. But it is a nice visual. But the fruit is cool because it does look like hops. And the, the fruit itself actually has, uh, is blown up with air. Uh, and, and it is kind of cool. It will turn brown in the fall. It fades from a kind of yellowish green to a brown. Here in this picture, you can see how it's dotted with the light green. That's all the fruit all over it. So it just adds a neat little feature to it. But again, diversity, really no pests, 
Really nice tree. Uh, Amber cork tree. This one too. No pests. You know, and, and I don't understand why we're not promoting these more. Why? And, and that's again why I'm so glad that emerald ash borer is coming through. Uh, bark is really heavy and corky. And it, this is one where you, you want to touch it. You don't realize you want to touch it until you finally do touch it, and then you don't want to take your hands off from it because it is a spongy cork, and it's maybe not necessarily the most attractive uh, bark, but it, but it's spongy and it's really weird. And as soon as you experience it, you just got to touch it. Uh, but it's wider than it is tall. So this is one that will never end up on a boulevard. It should never end up on a boulevard, but it, you know, is a nice park tree. Uh, but again, no pests. Uh, so we're going to look at the one on the left first, then look at the one on the right. So this is the pattern. So it's a really irregular look to it. And again, it, it has a spongy cork to it. They, just, they don't make cork from this bark. It's from other species. But it, it just has a really neat uh, feel to it. Now, it does have the inner bark is yellow. It's one of the few species that uh, the inner bark is yellow. But again, that's not a good thing to test and find. Not very helpful to the tree. Um, we have uh, sycamore. And this is one that's out of NDSU, but they are growing across the state. Uh, it's one that I think we definitely should be utilizing a lot more. Uh, it is a bigger tree, though, so you know, you're looking 40, 50 foot tall, 20, 30 foot wide. It's a big tree, but it starts to exfoliate in, in these pieces that will shed very early on uh, in this young branching, and then the older growth continues to peel into this kind of a gray type of a peeling, and you get kind of a mottled effect with multiple colors, so it's really, really attractive. Uh, amber choke cherry, uh, you get a really nice cinnamon brown bark to it, 30 by 30. You know, again, we do have the flowering effect as well. Uh, you know, so we do get a really nice color. We also get the exfoliating bark. One of the problems that we do have is splitting with uh, snow loads. So that can be problematic with this tree. You know, this is typical to see a nice crack going through it. So it's not necessarily one I would recommend, but it does have ornamental bark that's quite attractive. Swamp white oak is definitely one we should be utilizing a lot more. 50 by 50, it's a big tree, drought tolerant, you know, that's a great feature for it. But the young branching, it starts out, again, with this exfoliating bark, you know, which is not very typical of oak. So really good urban tree for us. Here you can see another shot where the bark is just splitting. I mean, it looks like it's, it has a disease or something where it's trying to split and shed the bark. But there it is, and then it does uh, hold on to its foliage into the fall or into the winter, so you got kind of a neat effect there. Burr oak uh, is highly variable in its bark. You know, it's one that, again, is a good urban tree for us. Now, we do have diseases moving in on that, too, so again, diversity. There's a new one called burr oak blight that's going to decimate the burr oaks. Uh, 70 by 70, pH adaptable. Again, it's variable in the amount of cork. Some you can find are quite corky. What you should, though, if you're looking to, to grow a bur oak, when you go to the nursery, find one that has extensive amount of cork, because that will be a characteristic that holds on into its maturity. If it's light on cork, these corky extensions, it will never develop more cork. It, it will always be light on the corky extensions. So there are some now that are being selected for the thick corkiness. Uh, so cobblestone oak, that's a cultivar from J. Frank Schmidt, where it's been selected early on for that type of corkiness. Uh, peak and lilac. Uh, Japanese tree lilacs are really popular. It's one of the most popular uh, tree that's being planted now. I recommend peak and lilac, because Japanese tree lilac does not have exfoliating bark, whereas peak and lilac does. And you still have everything, because it's a subspecies of Japanese tree lilac. And so you still get the, the creamy panicle flower, but then you get exfoliating bark. And there's several cultivars that have been selected for this coppery color, one being copper curls from NDSU. And it maintains this peeliness all the way into its maturity. It, the, the color does fade a little bit, but it just is a, quite a striking plant. There is China snow uh, out of the Morton Arboretum, and that's one that's also been selected for a high amount of this coppery kind of color and the exfoliating bark. So beautiful, beautiful tree. Uh, again, the, the pecanensis, they tend to be a little bit more multi-stemmed, as you can see here. So that's one of the, the disadvantages as compared to straight reticulata, the Japanese tree lilac. They're just gorgeous bark. 
uh, just a couple of evergreens and we'll be done. This is my, one of my favorite trees, lace bark pine. Uh, you know, I don't understand why people are not planting it more. I uh, found it when I was in Inner Mongolia, which is the exact uh, climate that we have. And so we're working on this one now. Uh, 30 by 30. Uh, one problem, though, it can have some limb breakage issues with the crotch angles that it has. But I think it's definitely worth uh, trying. Um, this is one, though, I, I don't know about a zone three. If you're, if you're in a true zone three, I would be hesitant in using this. For those of us in the zone four here now, uh, this is one, you know, definitely, you know, Fargo, Bismarck, and across uh, the zone four uh, range. But it does have this ex exfoliating bark, and I call it the camo tree, because once it starts uh, dropping that bark, it ends up looking like this. So you get all these different shades of green and all these different patterns. And you know, it ranges from some yellows, some greens, and again, this is kind of washed out. This is all pink all through here. So you know, some can be turned more of a pinky color. So it's quite attractive. Uh, last is our scotch pine. I think a lot of us are, are familiar with scotch pine. Really nice pine for us. Uh, tolerates drier sites. It's pH adaptable. You, know, you identify it by the orange upper bark. And it does uh, exfoliate uh, quite readily, so it's quite attractive. But this past summer, I was in Chicago, and I saw one of the coolest things where in a Japanese garden, they were using scotch pine and pruning it to uh, get this Japanese look. And I think, wow, well, that, that would look awesome in everybody's backyard, uh, pruning it that way. And I'm like, that's how all scotch pines should look. You know, don't leave a natural. Prune them off like this in the layers. Because that's what scotch pine does. They like that horizontal branching. So just gorgeous, gorgeous specimen. So I'm going to get some and start doing this to them. And even out at our research farm, if they ever come out, we're going to, they're all going to look like this. <laughs> so with that, happy trees is with all the different uh, ornamental qualities, but more importantly, diversity, so we can combat our pests. Thank you, Todd. I'll give us a question, and Todd, if you could please remember to repeat yep. the question. First question has to do with how much of what this bark is genetic, how much is environmental, is there anything we can do in caring for the trees to create more bark? Okay, so the question was how much is genetic, how much is environmental with this bark? And for the most part it is primarily all genetic. And that's what uh, breeders and, and uh, plant uh, improvement people are actually looking at, like that cobblestone oak is actually selecting for bark color such as like with copper curls, pecan lilac. Because here on campus, we have copper curls next to a straight pecan lilac. The straight pecan lilac has a dark brown, not very exciting bark, whereas the copper curls has that coppery bark. They both exfoliate the same, but the copper curls is copper, whereas this other one is not. And so uh, that's been propagated asexually, planted everywhere, and it maintains that bark. There's not a whole lot we can do to necessarily enhance that. Like with the lace bark pine, you could. And, but again, you know, maybe as us as avid gardeners, because we're a little crazy, we could go out there and actually peel. It's the same with like the sycamore. You can actually pull the bark off and create these patterns. There's another tree. It's not suitable for our zone, but it's a Japanese stewardia. And I actually recommend to people, they actually scrub their bark. Because as you get the plated pieces come off, they discolor over time at different rates, and that's how you get that weird coloring. But there's really not a whole lot we can do. It's just properly selecting trees that have these. And, and the idea, again, is like with the Baroque. You know, if you're selecting what the nursery, and a lot of them are propagated by seed, if they're not necessarily a true cultivar, is select ones that have good bark right from the beginning. Okay, the next question has to do with hardiness. Uh, especially up in northern counties, maybe there's some skepticism out there about the hardiness of these trees. Can you highlight some of these trees that may not survive from the least hardy ones we talked about tonight? Yeah, the lace bark pine. So the question was, you know, hardiness, especially in the northern counties. You know, there's some skepticism on survivability of these. And, and honestly, I think, you know, there are a few in here that, that I would put borderline, like the Katsura tree. I would definitely put as a solid four, untested three. Lace bark pine is definitely a, a four, uh, questionable three. You know, and those are things that I'm going to be working on in the coming years to, to test them 
uh, at some different various sites in, in the north. You know, we're going to be planting at Langdon. We're going to be planting at Williston. To test some of these and, and hopefully we can find out. But, but definitely, yeah, with that lace bark pine and the Ketsura, I'd be very questionable on, on using those. A lot of the other ones, I wouldn't have any problem getting into a zone three. And, because I really, that's what I try to focus with this talk is to focus on zone three, four plants. You talk about uh, finding these kind of trees in North Dakota nurseries. Do you have any tips on finding some that are relatively unknown in most nurseries? Yeah, so the question was finding these, especially in North Dakota. You know, that's one thing that, that can be difficult. Uh, you just have to work with your nurseries, you know, and that's the key is, is not only educating ourselves, but educating them. You know, the reason that there's so much ash in North Dakota is because it's a tree that is extremely easy to grow in the nursery industry, and it does very well in any environment. That's why we ended up with ash, because it was easy. And, and hopefully everybody's learning now that easy is not a good thing. And so we do need to go to the nurseries and start asking for them. You know, I guarantee you're not going to walk to any nursery in, in North Dakota and find a cat or a tree. But if you tell them that I would like a cat or a tree, there's likelihood in the future that they would be looking to get that. I know nurseries here around the Fargo area are very proactive. They're willing to, to extend beyond their own general knowledge and, and explore. But it, but it really is an educational thing for us and them. Next question has to do with some of your selections on saline soils. Mm -hmm. And they specifically mentioned uh, orange, angel, maple, the northern tribute river birch, the yep. prairie green paper birch, the sur tree. Can they grow in southwest North Dakota with the saline soil? Um, Cassura tree, I would say no. That, that may be a difficulty. Uh, with the others, they, they should be fairly okay. Um, and the, the, the river birch, that river birch, and I recommend the northern tribute. Again, it's not going to be one that's available for another five, ten years. That's the big problem with our program here in North Dakota is that it's a slow process uh, to get a plant out. But for a river birch in itself, it has this, uh, the northern tribute has all the characteristics that a river birch does not. You know, it really shouldn't be a river birch, even though it is. It likes compacted soils. It likes high pH. It's tolerant to drought. You know, those are all features that river birch should not be, uh, but this one was, because it was actually selected from Dickinson. So this river birch does very well in the southwest part of the state. Okay. Um, you how about you talk about your slides are beautiful, but how about can we see these with our own eyes someplace? Yeah. Is there an art raven in North Dakota? Is there a field day in Ensoretta? So the question is, can we see these with our eyes? Where can we see these in North Dakota? And, and the answer is yes, you can see these with your eyes. Unfortunately, very limited locations. Uh, one being at, at Saraka, that's the uh, NDSU Horticulture Research Farm, uh, located just east of Absaraca by a few miles. And we do have a field day, generally in August. Uh, we haven't picked the date yet, um, but we will. And then when we do that, we'll be uh, giving that information to all the county extension agents. So hopefully we'll, that information will be available to everyone. But we have most of those out there. Uh, we are working on the lace bark pine now. Uh, we're building up a population, so I don't have those to show you. But generally, everything else that you've seen here uh, are already in your community or can be seen where we're at. Because it's amazing how much is actually out there because there's a lot of people like us that are willing to try things. So be surprised that there isn't most of this somewhere in North Dakota. Which of these barky trees grow faster? Oh, um, well, obviously, like the bur oak, you're looking at a slower growth rate, but it's you know worth it over time. Uh, which grows the fastest? I mean, they're all variable in growth. Um, uh, that's a hard question to answer. None. What do you mean, not none? <laughs> yeah, you got to be patient with them. Yeah, Freeman Maple, look. Not a fan. Question here. So I have a question. We just bought a house that has an existing tree out by the street that the previous owners banged up the bark around the basement for one more oh, yeah. quite a bit. 
Is there a point where it's not worth kind of saving the street? Or? So the question was, uh, this gentleman uh, bought a house. The street tree has been uh, pruned or trimmed with a lawnmower. Uh, mechanical damage is what you know. What, what do you do? Is there a way to save it, or is it just an end cause? Uh, at that point, yeah, really, if there's enough damage around, it's been pretty much girdled, and it's just on a downward spiral. There's nothing really you can do to it. Uh, you know, now's the time to diversify, get something else in its place. Because uh, I'm assuming it's ash or maple. It most likely is. You know, it's, it's sad that, again, we haven't learned, but that's, you know, most likely. Or even a linden, you know. That's the other thing now is we got um, Japanese beetles coming into uh, North Dakota, too, and they decimate lindens. Um, and we have lots of lindens. So, again, we've got to diversify. Question. <laughs> okay, so the question is, if you get on a stress kick and you start peeling the bark off, can you damage the tree? Uh, you know, to a point, you know, because you don't want to act, cause any wounding to it. Um, you know, with a lot of those peeling barks, I mean, that's what they do naturally, but you don't obviously want to just tear it all off because you're, you're going to cause stress to the tree and potentially wounding. Um, but, you know, it would take a lot of effort, but, but it's definitely not, not encouraged. Get a stress ball. No, never feel far. Question. Regarding the swamp white oak, is that zone four? Yeah, so the swamp white oak, question is it a zone four? Yes, it's a zone four. Uh, the question now was uh, pest and disease. Uh, are there any issues with that? Uh, with the swamp white oak, really not so much. Uh, you know, there there are some oak wilt that we could potentially worry about, but for the most part, not too bad. Again, it's it's more the diversity in maintaining that. You know, you don't, we don't want a full boulevard of swamp white oaks, but that add the diversity in. Uh, how about the hardiness of it? Uh, northern advanced American plane tree. Yeah. So the question is, what about the hardiness of the northern advanced plane tree? Uh, I would be comfortable in a zone four. Uh, it really hasn't been tested in a true zone three. So that's still to be determined. We are propagating it now, and we will have hopefully plants in uh, Williston and in Langdon this year. So that's going to be to be determined. Last question. Uh, Another, there are a lot of hardiness questions. Oh, sure. American hornbeam, Amor cork tree. Mm -hmm. Are you in the northwest Florida? So the question is, uh, Amor cork tree and American hornbeam. Horn uh, I would be hesitant with the Amor cork tree, uh, maybe in a protected spot. You know, none of these trees in general, I mean, you just can't leave them out in the open. Uh, you know, we're looking at a lot of these being you know, protected interior city type parks and residents and, you know, not on a farmstead for a windbreak. I'm not a windbreak person. I don't promote any windbreak trees at all. Uh, I am an ornamental specialist, so these are not windbreak trees. Do not put any of them in a windbreak. Uh, do not plant them out into an exposed acreage. You know, that's not what these are for. Um, but, you know, amber cork tree, I would be questionable in a zone three. Uh, American hornbeam, I wouldn't be so concerned with. Uh, but again, it's not one that I would put out in the open, you know, to, to just to be left to die. Okay, let's say time. <laughs> okay, we got a five-minute break. <laughs>